choir sounded really good this morning. Amen. Appreciate that. Uh, did a good job. And also appreciate that singing by Miss Angie. And you can't ever go wrong singing about the cross. Amen. The cross, the cross. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. All right, if you will, let's go ahead and get started this morning. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Uh, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not trying to preach anything new. I like what the preachers said of old. If it's new, it probably ain't true. Amen. So uh, we're just going to be preaching an old truth. But I'm going to be preaching to you and hoping that there is not one person in here leave lost. Uh, I have heard and I've read statistics by preachers and evangelists and, 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 and so-called scholars and professors of the Word of God. And many, many, many times I keep hearing this quoted repeatedly that the greatest mission field today is in your average church pew. The churches are filled with lost people. Lost people, people that know about the Lord, they know that He died, they know that He was buried, they know that He rose again the third day, but they themselves have never truly, personally accepted that as their payment for their sin. They're not saved. They, they, they sit in church where the gospel is preached. They sit in church where the truth is proclaimed, yet they themselves do not possess that truth or that hope or that salvation. Today I hope and pray that you will listen. Today if there's any doubt in your mind, in your heart, I hope that we can clarify it today. I just want to preach on a simple thought here this morning. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, look in, uh, look in uh, chapter 5 and let's look at verse 6. The Bible says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want to stop there and just draw my title and my text from that verse 8. It says there, But God commended His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, here's what I want to focus on, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. He came to die. He knew His purpose was to go up Calvary's hill. Every step that He took, every decision that He made, when He came out and He opened up His ministry at the age of 30 and started walking for three and a half years with His disciples, He knew that every step, every decision was drawing Him and leading Him closer to that point. Calvary, where he was going to die and pay for our sins. Now I know that we have heard it talked about many times that, uh, that the Bible is about salvation, but I'm going to tell you something. The Bible is about a king and his kingdom. Amen. The main theme of this book is not you or I's salvation. The main theme of this book is the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom. That he come to build. Amen. Thank God I got in. Thank God you got in. But that wasn't the main focus. The main focus was the king and his kingdom. And Jesus came to establish a kingdom. And everything in this book rallies around that main theme. Even the cross. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. In the Old Testament, you have the prophecies 
of the cross. The Old Testament prophesied of what was coming. The Old Testament uh, was a picture of what was going to take place. That don't mean they were saved by those pictures. Amen. They weren't saved by looking forward to the cross like a lot of people preach today. That wasn't the truth of the story, but they, but we in the New Testament looking back can see that the Old Testament prophesied of Calvary. The lamb, the, excuse me, the animal that was slain, the innocent substitute that was slain, that was killed by the Lord to cover the sins of Adam and Eve, to cover their nakedness, was a picture of what Jesus was going to do for you and I. Its blood was shed. Its life was given. Innocent substitute. Paying for the guilty sinners. And covering their nakedness. That's what the Lord did for us. We're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're covered by His righteousness. Right. Amen. Amen. When we by faith trust Him, God no longer sees that filth and that nakedness before Him. He sees His Son. Amen. Yeah. The Old Testament prophesied of that. You say, wait a minute. Yes, the Old Testament prophesied of it. The animal sacrifices all through the, the, the Old Testament, the tabernacle and the temple, the hundreds of thousands and millions of animals that were slain, all pointing to what Jesus was coming to do. Die for you and I. Isaiah described some of the suffering that he would go through. Psalms 22, even declaring the words that he would say while hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Old Testament prophesied of the cross. <coughs> then you get to the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, and not, not only do we see the prophecy of the cross in the Old Testament, but we see the person for the cross. You say, what do you mean the person for the cross? Listen, many died by crucifixion. Many were nailed to crosses. Many were lifted up before man in between heaven and earth. Many died that cruel, harsh death. But what was different about this one was the person. The one that died on the cross at Calvary in between the two thieves was no ordinary person. It was a virgin born, virgin born son of God. Right. Flowing through his veins was the very blood of God himself. Amen. Jesus Christ. Well, you get a hold of that and think about that. This is the same guy that, that healed the sick, that raised the dead, that walked on the water. The same one that had compassion on the outcasts of society and preached and ministered to those who would not get it any otherwise. Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Boy, that's good when you say that, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Jesus. Then you come to Acts. You know what you have in Acts? You see the power of the cross. Right. The power of the cross. Peter gets up and he preaches the person of the cross and what he did. There, how he shed his blood and he died and he rose again the third day. He preached the gospel and thousands got saved. That's the power of the gospel. And then we see uh, in the epistles, when we get into the epistles, we see the plan of the cross. The plan of the cross is that he could build himself. Uh, God was calling out a, a bride for his son. He, the, the, through, through Paul, he, he reveals the mysteries that he had purposed in his heart from the foundation of the world and calling out a bride for his son and he reveals his plan and purpose for the cross and for us. And then finally, after you get through the epistles, you get to the last book of the Bible, Revelations, and then we see the preeminence of the cross. You know what we're going to be singing about in heaven? We're not going to be singing about our Chevrolet truck and our old gloves. Right. We're not going to be singing about our Budweiser's and all these different things. We're going to be singing about the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And the shed blood. 
Jesus is pictured as the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And when we get into heaven, you know what we're going to be singing? We're going to be singing, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. While we're singing, Worthy is the Lamb, the cherubim and the seraphim are going to be sounding in going, Holy, Holy, Holy. And then we're in the background, Worthy is the Lamb. We're going to sing His praises for all eternity. You talk about a heavenly choir. I like that song where it talks about, you know, we're going to be singing in the heavenly choir. And I like it. They sing rejoice and the, the, the ladies have their part and the men have their part. Now, now, I want you to think about this. In the Old Testament, they're going to be singing, worthy is the Lord God that, that saved them. Amen. They're going to be singing, he's worthy, he's holy, he's just. And, and then we get to us and we're going to be saying, worthy is the Lamb because we, we got there a different way. We got there through the blood of Christ. Then you're going to have those from the tribulation. They're going to be singing about how good He is and how he, he, they overcome through Him and, his, and how, they, how He's provided for them. Boy, I tell you, you get to thinking about that then during the millennium, those that can see Him and those that served Him. You talk about a four-part choir. I mean, we can read in Revelations 4 and 5 and see the two part real easy. Right. We see the 24 elders saying, worthy is the Lord. And then you see the, the, the cherubim going, holy, holy. Now think about that. Maybe the, maybe the cherubim's got them deep voices and they're coming in, holy, <laughs> holy, holy. Got that deep section. Then you got the tenor section coming in. Where? is the Lamb. Amen. And then you got the baritones and all the different parts I know nothing about. <laughs> but boy, I like it when I hear it. Right. Amen. Amen. And we're going to get to experience it for all eternity. Amen. We're going to get to be there and experience that. Woo! Glory to His name. Amen. Jesus. What a blessing. What a blessing. But, but let's look at this passage a little bit closer. Look, look at verse 6 at the end of the verse. It says, In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Who did he die for? The ungodly. The ungodly. First thing I want to point out is the sinner. Paul doesn't, doesn't sugarcoat it. He just puts it out there like it is. Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the sinner. Did you know you were born a sinner? Well, preacher, I'm, no, I'm not ungodly. I'm not that bad. You're wicked! And you might as well get a hold of it. Amen? You were born a sinner. Let's look at what he says. Let's, let's just look at it. In verse 6 it says, For when we were yet without strength, you're weak. Christ died for the ungodly. Not only are you without strength, but you're ungodly according to that verse. That's wicked. Then, keeps on going, for scarcely a righteous man would die, yet perish for a good man would dare die, but God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, sinners, there's another description of us. Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, for if, when we were enemies. Did you catch that? We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Right. You know, that's a description of you when you're lost. You're weak. You're wicked. You're without God and without hope. Right. Enemies. Enemies. You are no longer in the... You are not in the camp of Christ. You're not in God's camp. You're in the enemy's camp. You were born a sinner. Your mama was a sinner. Her mama was a sinner. And her mama too. Amen. Amen. Say, preacher, don't you talk about my mama. Your mama was a sinner. Amen. You were born a sinner. You have that blood flowing through your veins. Unless you get born again. Amen. And that's not going back into your mama's womb like Nicodemus thought in John chapter 3. That's by faith, trusting in the Lord and being made alive spiritually yeah. unto Jesus Christ. That's right. Amen. The sinner is a weak person, powerless, unable to help themselves, unable 
to save yourself. You know men have been trying to save themselves for millennia. They've been trying to save themselves. No good works. Good deeds. I mean, you can polish up a turd so long, it's still just a turd. <laughs> Amen. All our righteousness is filthy rags. Right. You say, preacher, that's awful. That's terrible language. You understood it, though. Amen. Right. We're sinners in need of a Savior. Yeah. Without putting your faith and trust in Christ, there is no hope. You can turn over all the new leaves you want to. You can put down your drugs, your alcohol. You can quit drinking. You can quit smoking. You can quit whoring around. You can quit doing all that and still be a wicked sinner and enemy of God. Yep. Amen. Amen. Enemy of God. You know what's so sad? When we talk about being wicked and sinners and and vile in the sight of God and without hope, we always picture some 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 sick, dirty, uh, perverted person out in the world or out in the gutter with needles in their arms. But I'm telling you, they're sitting in church pews with Bibles in their laps. They're just as wicked, just as perverted, and still an enemy of God if they've never accepted Him personally. Yeah. Just as by going to the same hell. Going to the same hell. Going to suffer the same fate. Have no hope. Just like no vile drug addict. No hope. Unsaved church member is just as godless as any wicked person in this world. One time, Sir, Fran Sir, Sir Francis Newport, he was the head of an English infidel club, and he was dying, and on his deathbed, he said to those who was around him, You need not tell me there is no God, for I know there is one, and I am in his angry presence at this moment. You need not tell me there's no hell. For I already feel my soul slipping into its flame. My soul slipping into its flames. Wretches, cease your idle talk. And he slipped into eternity. He closed his eyes. His last words were, Wretches, cease your idle talk. Well, when I get to heaven... I'll tell him I'm as good as so-and-so and I didn't do as bad as so-and-so. Hey, listen, that was my stupid excuse. That's, that was the, that's what I thought. When I was lost, I thought, well, I ain't as bad as old so-and-so and they go down there to church all the time. I mean, I partied with some of those guys that went to that church and they say they're going to heaven and if they're going to heaven, I'm a shoe-in. Amen? I'll just point to them and say, I ain't as bad as they are. I didn't do what they did, so I ought to be all right. But it don't matter what they did. It's what I didn't do. I didn't accept the Lord Jesus Christ myself. See, it don't matter what they did. It don't matter what they didn't do. My salvation is dependent on what I do. I heard, uh, heard about a, a little boy said, my daddy went to prison for something he didn't do. And he's crying and he's talking about it in school. And the teacher said, well, what didn't he do? He said he didn't wipe his hands off the fingerprints off the safe. That's what he didn't do. <laughs> he went to prison for something he didn't do. Amen. Some of you get it out of a while. As one old, as I read a story, and hey, this is hilarious. This is hilarious. This really happened. I read a story that one, one bank robber, he, or safe you know, cracker, he, he really messed him up for years. That, that just baffled the police. He was using his toes. <laughs> I mean, he was trying to match fingerprints to toes, amen. <laughs> Could you see that? that just, it's a whole new thing to stinking money, don't it? <laughs> Filthy lucre, amen. But anyway, there's a sinner. But let's look at the Savior. Because really, the sinner is not what's important. The sinner is, is helpless. We know that we are utterly, 
totally helpless. And I want you to see that. How can I get you to see that? Jesus died between two thieves. Their hands was nailed to a cross. Could they turn over and do some great work? No, their hands was nailed to a cross. Their feet were nailed to a cross. Could they do some great thing and do some great trip or do some great work for the Lord? No, they're nailed to a cross. They are so utterly helpless that if a fly landed in their face, they couldn't even chew it off. I mean, how are you going to get a fly off of you? Right. How many of you ever had a horse fly out to you? Mm -hmm. Amen. I've had a horse fly just about chase me off a tractor. Amen. <laughs> I mean, them things get after you. They just are relentless. Amen. It's like teenagers in your check, checkbook. Amen. They're just relentless they act after that money. Amen. <laughs> They're just more, 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 more. Amen. But anyway, totally helpless. But let's look at the Savior a little bit. I want to point out something that's, that, that, that you need to think about. It may help you. Look at verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us while we were sinners, while we were ungodly, while we were enemies, while we were estranged from while we wanted nothing to do with Him, He still loved us enough to die for us. Amen. Now look at what it says. For scarcely... For a righteous man will one die. Scarcely somebody would die for somebody like that. Would you die for somebody like that? Who would you die for? Would you give your life for your mama? Would you give your life for your daddy? Would you give your life for your kids? A brother or a sister? Would you give your life for someone that you care for? Well, that's noble and that's great. And there's many reports of people doing such as that. But Jesus gave his life for his enemies. Right. He loved his enemies. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still living it up, while we were still cussing and doing things that we shouldn't do and not thinking about him or caring about him, he died for us. You know what he said? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They just nailed him to a cross and lifted it up and let it drop into that hole and all that pain running through his body. He still said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's the love of God for you. Amen. While you were yet a sinner. I read a story about James Kidd of Wheaton, Illinois. He was visiting his son and they went to a restaurant, an Italian restaurant, and a gunman entered in and he shot 11 dead. His wife told the story about the father who went to visit his son and eat with him. And they said, the son survived, but the father didn't. The father was shot in the back. What did he do? He jumped in front of his son and wrapped his arms around his son as they fell to the ground. The, sh the shot goes off and goes into the father's back. He gave his life to save his son. You say, how noble. And then we read reports how, how in war sometimes that, uh, they would be in the trench and they would be in the, they would be in the trenches and everything and there'd be a grenade fall in the trench. And all the men is going to die. There's no way to climb out of there in time. But somebody falls on the grenade and saves all these buddies giving his life. You say, how noble, how, how honorable is that? And you're right. But how about this? You're a captive. You're an enemy. I mean, and you've been a prisoner of war now. You've been captured. And your friend's trying to save you, not realizing you're in that pit with those guys and they throw it in there. Would you jump on the grenade and save your enemies? That's exactly what Jesus did. Right. He died for his enemies. He gave his life for those that curse him and mock him and laugh and ridicule and laugh at his children and mock his children, calling them Bible thumpers and Jesus freaks and all this stuff. He died for you. He made a way where you don't have to pay for the sin in your life. Amen. 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 
That's what happened at Calvary. God poured out His wrath on Jesus Christ. And Jesus took it so you wouldn't have to. Preacher, I don't see it. I just don't see it. Well, you're not looking at Calvary. You're not looking at the cross. Look at the cross and just imagine the pain that he was going through, the suffering that he was going through. At any time, he could have called legions of angels down and they could have rescued him and ministered to him and, 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 he, and he could have healed himself. But he didn't let it happen. I imagine the angels up in heaven was looking over the balcony with their swords drawn, waiting. Just say the word. Just say the word. Just say the word. I'll cut every one of them's head off. Just say the word. I'll kill them all. The very idea that they spat in the Lord's face, that they mocked him and beat him and ridiculed him. I imagine the host of heaven was poised and ready to wipe out this world. And wouldn't even break a sweat doing it. But Jesus stayed them off. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Can you not see the love? Can you not see the compassion in the cross? Jesus died for us. Not only the Savior... In the sinner, but let's look at the salvation, verse 9. In verse 9, look at this. It says, much more than being now justified by His blood. How are we justified by His blood? His blood is paying for sin. Our sin. Man is sin and man must shed his blood. Do you know why we no longer offer up bulls and oxen and and sheep and turtle doves, why we no longer offer up those animals. See, man had sinned, and that blood of animals was just a temporary covering. We needed man's blood to pay for man's sin. It took a man to provide what we needed. Man had sinned, man needs to pay the price. But no other man could do it but Jesus Christ. Why? Because if I would have died on the cross, I would be paying for my sins. It would be my sins that I was paying for. I did wrong. I had messed up. I had fallen short. I missed the mark. It would be my sins that I'd be paying for. I couldn't do you any good. And there's been no man alive that could take your place but one. His name was Jesus. He was sinless. He didn't have a he didn't have a wrong thought. He didn't have a, you say, well, pre well, well he run him out. That was justifiable and right. When he made a scourge and run him out for turning his house into a, a profiting place and all that stuff. So he did right. Every decision, every thought, everything was in the Father's will and perfect. Yeah. He was dying as an innocent substitute. Right. He was paying your price. God poured out His wrath on Jesus Christ for your sin and mine. And if we will accept it by faith, His blood pays for our sins. If we'll call on Jesus and say, Jesus, save me. It's that simple. I believe that you took my place on Calvary. I believe that that's the blood. That's all that I need is His blood. And by faith, He'll cover you. That's, how, that's salvation. That's the simplicity of salvation. When you call on the Lord, His blood that was shed is accredited to your account. The sins that you had committed had been put on Jesus and paid for at Calvary. That's why we sing so much about that precious blood because it's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes us from sins. That clean, innocent, pure blood. We stand justified. Saints from wrath. Look at this. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. We don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. 
You can be saved from that wrath. He has already suffered it on Calvary. You want to reject Him? Then wrath's coming. There's a payday someday. You're not getting out. You're not going to be any exception. Everybody thinks, well, I'll be the exception. I'll be the one. No, you won't. You're fooling yourself. It's not going to happen. You either accept Jesus or you'll die in your sins and you'll have to face them and pay for them. And you can't ever pay for them. That's why hell's eternity. You keep paying forever and ever and ever and ever. You say, well, preacher, I've never done anything wrong. I ain't done nothing that bad. Have you ever told a lie? How many in here has ever told a lie? I'm holding up both hands. Amen. And those that didn't raise your hand, you're lying now. That's the truth of it. Amen. Right. How many have ever looked and lusted after someone? Don't raise your hands out on the house full of perverts. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But, but, but seriously, how many have ever lied? You've ever lusted? You ever coveted something that wasn't yours? Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. How many of you have gotten mad at a brother without a cause? I mean, you just got mad at somebody and it really wasn't justifiable. You didn't, at the time, maybe it seemed justifiable, but you're mad at far as somebody wanted to kill him. I mean, dead. Picture choking him to death. <laughs> Say, preacher, are you telling on yourself? Yeah. Both hands. <laughs> Amen. I picture kill a lot of people. You say, preacher, oh, I used to love the mixed start mixed martial arts. I mean, I sent my kids through mixed martial arts, and I love watching that stuff on TV. I mean, I, I liked it. You say, preacher, you shouldn't. I know I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't. It's violent. I know. I know. But man, it wasn't that. It wasn't that running around in purple panties and smacking each other on the chest stuff. No, no, it wasn't that fake wrestling stuff. That's foolishness. These guys hit you in the eyes, roll back in their head, and they go stiff, <laughs> fall in the floor, and blood comes out. Amen. I'm sitting there on the edge of my seat, rip his arm off, take it home with you. Amen. That's good. I mean, they get him in the arm bar, and I don't see how the arm stays attached. Just crack it and just, just go ahead and rip it off and put it in your pocket. Trophy! You say, preacher, you're violent. You're violent. Yeah, that's that sin nature, and you got it too. Right. Amen. See, we think we're perfect, and we like to pretend we're perfect, but the truth of the matter is we're sinners in need of a Savior. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to pay for those sins for all eternity, and you'll never get them paid for. Never get them paid for. Never get them paid for. But I thank the Lord that if you put your faith and trust in His blood, you'll never have to worry about it again. You are justified. Right. Justified in every sin. You are reconciled. You are no longer an enemy, but you're a child of God. He has brought you in as part of Him. Amen. What a blessing. You've been adopted into the family. Amen. And thank the Lord, He is a good stepfather. He's not going to beat you like a redhead stepchild. Amen. I don't know who came up with that, but they had to find this redhead. What do you think, Justin? <laughs> well, you say, preacher, you're going to get in trouble but I'm, I'm, I'm messing up a good message and I tend to do that from time to time but you know what I'm saying is true I'm going to close I'm going to close with this I'm going to give you something to think about here we should praise the Lord for what he's done for us he saved us Amen. when we couldn't save ourselves he saved us when no one else could do it no one else could do it only He can do it. He's the person for the cross. Right. No one else can do it. You can't do it for yourself. Only He could. My question is, are you sure you're saved? I don't want one person to leave this church after hearing me preach and die lost. I would hate to think that I stand at the judgment one day and I preach, your blood's got on my hand, I've told you. But I'd hate to get there and watch you come up at the judgment. And he said, depart from me, you curse it into everlasting fire. I never knew you. You knew about him, but you never called on him. You knew what he'd done and what you needed to be saved but you thought you was all right, thought you had a little more time. 
The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Boast thyself not of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. If you're here and you're not saved, if you're here and you have doubts, if you're here and there's any concerns at all, I want to encourage you to settle it today. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes if Brother Bobby comes and gets us a song. <coughs> and uh, I, I believe we will sing, sing an invitation this morning. I haven't done that in a while, but we're going to give a, a formal invitation. I want to give you an opportunity to come and pray. Maybe, maybe you're here and you just want to thank the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord that He saved your soul. Amen. June 9th, 1992, I accepted the Lord as my Savior. I haven't looked back and I haven't doubted and I haven't worried about it since. Why? That's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Changed my life. Maybe you're here and you need that today. While heads is bowed and eyes is closed, let me ask you this question. Is there anybody here say, Preacher, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. If, the, if I was to die in a car wreck, God forbid, but if I was to die in a car wreck today, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. Let me see your hand. Anybody in the building? Anybody in the building? God bless you, ma'am. I see that hand. Honest hand. I thank you for that. Anybody else? Say, preacher, how about this? I know I'm lost. I know I need to be saved. Let me see your hand. I know I'm lost and I know I need to be saved. Let me see your hand. All right. What about this? I'm saved and I know I'm saved. Let me see your hand. I'm saved and I know I'm saved. Right, God bless you. If you can't raise your hand there, you're who the message was for. Let's all sing one. Let's all stand with what song we got, brother? Just as I am, 81. 81, just as I am. You know, that's how you get saved, just like you are. You don't turn over a new leaf. You don't try anything new. You come just as I am. Just as I am. I know your testimony, you're saved. Some of you probably say, Preacher, I've heard better preaching. That's that's true. That's true. I have to admit, you, you can hear better preaching all the time. But I've been praying that the Lord would deal with somebody. And if God's dealing with your heart, if God spoke to you and you know that you need to get things right, this is the last stanza. Don't wait. Come get things right. Maybe you just need to come and thank you, whatever the reason. But don't leave here if your heart's not right with God today, okay? Whatever you need, He can provide. Verse 3. Just as I am, thou be receive.